introductions. And also, we are broadcasting. Hey, Elon. Thank you for coming. Hi, Andy. I was okay, going to I, make I, a joke that all the remaining mis mistakes are, are, are due to Elon, but now that you are here. <laughs> I can Hello. leave. I can leave so you can make any jokes. Hello, everyone. We are going to wait a second or two for other people to join. I think I, I'll, I'll do the introduction. So welcome to this session of the Virtual Seminars in Economic Theory. And today we have a great pleasure to uh, host uh, Andy Skripac all the way from Stanford, California. Uh, Andy will present Persuasion with Multiple Actions. And this is joint work with David Kantadze and Ilan Kramer, Kramer, who is also here with us. We also have two guest panelists, uh, Feili and Alex uh, Smolly. So welcome all and welcome to the audience. Let me just remind you, we are um, the, the, the talk is uh, one hour, our usual format. On top of that, we have 15 minutes uh, of the Q&A session. The talk is recorded and live streamed. Also, a reminder for next week, we will see Luciano Pomato from Caltech presenting the cost of information. And now, Andy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me. My name is Andy Skripac, and this is joint work with Elon Kramer, who is here, who is at Warwick and at Hebrew University, and David Kantadze, who was a student in uh, Warwick, and now he's in Tbilisi. And this, this project started with David's uh, dissertation, and then Elon was one of his advisors, and. Uh, I was at some point brought in to try to think whether we can we can generalize something. So so that's what I'm going to show you. Um, this has been a fun project. The talk will be basically I'm going to sh show you two theorems, and uh, one of them with basically complete proof. I think the other one with almost complete proof. So you know, feel free to stop me anytime you want to. This will this this is a relatively short talk. Okay, so what is it going to be about? So what we've been thinking about is situations where a decision a, a sender uh, is trying to influence decisions of multiple receivers. So what would be an, an example? An example would be there's a politician that would like to have a sequence of bills passed. And instead of introducing all the bills at once, that politician decides to introduce them one by one. And often politicians would say, you know, when the reporters ask them about some other future bills that, that, that there are rumors that may be coming, they would be often saying, you're not going to talk about that bill right now. Let's focus on this. And similar things happened before elections in the US. Before Biden was elected, politicians would ask him a lot of questions about his opinion about the Supreme Court. If he gets elected, would he change things about the Supreme Court? Then he would often say, this is not the topic of the discussion today. Today we're talking about elections. And that's something I don't have my position yet on. Once we, once, once I win the elections, we will come back to, the, to, to that topic. So this is one of those things that often happens that they introduce bills one by one and they, they want to have information disclosed about them uh, gradually. And at the same time, you know, this, the, the consequences of the bills are often not independent. And similarly, public opinion about them are not often independent. So as information about one of them gets disclosed, it's going to affect people's beliefs about the, the other bills. Okay. Similarly, if you think about how we do recruiting, you could imagine that uh, some hiring committee would be considering candidates and suppose they decide whether to make an offer on Monday to one candidate, on Tuesday to another candidate. And the idea will be that if we discuss strengths of weaknesses of candidate eight or A on, day, on Monday, the information revealed there is going to influence also people's beliefs about strengths and weaknesses of the other candidates. For example, if they are co-authors on some projects or if they have similar uh, background. So whatever information review for one, we're going to affect, affect the other. So that's what we wanted to study, this idea, what if 
and there will be multiple actions, but instead of doing persuasion just in one shot, you know, we can always think about a model in which there is multiple decision makers, but you, you can always just use the Bayesian persuasion model to say, well, I can always collapse them. There is a mapping from the beliefs into actions of everybody. So I can do a mapping from the same information I said to the payoffs of the sender. So if it was a one shot interaction, it was only one, one time revealing information. We already know how to model it. That's the standard Bayesian persuasion model. But what we do in this paper, we are going to use this framework Bayesian persuasion, but we're going to compare doing persuasion simultaneously to doing persuasion in one shot. So Andy, should I think about those decision maker have accidentality when they choose actions? Very well. So the way what we've done in this paper is we have decided to shut down all these externalities. Not that they are not interesting. Perfect. So at the very end, uh, one of the examples uh, that that we we consider at the very end of the paper is saying in the main body of the paper, payoffs of the receivers are additive. But what about if they are not additive? If, if this was instead of trying to get the pass of a sequence of bills, you are trying to get 51 senators to vote for your bill. And now there will be externalities because if you know the whether the decision of one senator is pivotal or not depends on what the other senators do. Okay. And you can imagine externalities happening two different ways. One is that the, that the receivers play a game among, among themselves. So that would take us more to like the information design work by, by Bergman and Morris. And the other way would be, even if the receivers themselves don't care about the interactions, the sender may care about the interactions, okay? And, in the talk today, we are going to focus on the case where ni neither of these channels is important, okay? So then there will be even more question, okay, if, if that's what's going on, would, a, would there be a difference between doing just one round of communication, a simultaneous procedure, or doing it a sequential procedure? And the questions we're going to answer is, when and why is a gradual, like by gradual, I mean sequential procedure, uh, better than a simultaneous procedure. And then the, the other part will be, what would be the optimal sequence? Okay. So I'll start with a few examples that illustrate what's going on, and then we'll do the general theorem. So the examples will be built like this. There will be three players. There will be one sender, and there will be two receivers. And what will be these two receivers? The receivers will be buyers of products. There will be, be a product for buyer A and a product for ba buyer B. The prices will be fixed. We'll not be doing anything with prices. So think about as being a salesperson that provides information. They don't have impact on prices, but they can try to convince people to buy the product. And those buyers will have some preferences over, over the good. And the preferences will depend whether whether the quality of the product is high or low. So it will be, be today in the talk, always working with binary states. So the state is either the good is, is a good match or a bad match or high quality or low quality. And they will be assigning this belief X. There will be some priors. Each person will say, this product is a good quality for me with this probability X. The seller's objective will be to maximize the number of goods they sell. So they want each person, you know, in this in these examples, the decisions will be binary. Either the buyer or don't, and the seller is trying to maximize the expected number of people who say yes. Uh, all the communication will be public. So these these two people uh, are in the store at the same time. And then the important element of the of the setup is that the actions are not reversible because if they are reversible, then doing it sequentially doesn't change anything. Because at the end, if people can undo their actions. They, they, you know, the fact that you reveal the information sequentially doesn't matter because their action will depend only on the final information review. Okay, so the standard, this is example zero. This is the standard judge example from Kamenets and Gensko. Uh, there is a buyer that will buy the product if and only if they believe that the 
the quality of the good is above some threshold alpha and we'll make it 0.8. Suppose that they start with a prior 0.5. They will buy only if their posterior is above 0.8. What do we do? Well, the post we know that the optimal, you know, we start here. The payoffs for the sender are zero if the belief is below 0.8. There are one, they are above 0.8. So what do you do? Well, the standard thing is we, we do the concavification. We induce posterior payoffs, sorry, posterior beliefs either of zero or 0.8. And that gives the expected payoff of 0.625. Okay. I've know you've still seen it, but this is just a reminder of how these models work. That's how you do optimal persuasion uh, with, with just one receiver. Okay. So now let's start introducing two receivers. And the first example will be like this. There will be these two buyers and two goods, A and B. And the prior will start again at 50-50. But the two goods will be perfectly negatively correlated. So that the buyers will, will know that only one of the goods is high quality and the other good is low quality. But they will not know which one is which. Okay. So each person, again, will have a threshold 0.8. And if we're going to only communicate with one person, we know what we would do. But here is the first claim. If the only thing I could do is simultaneous procedure, so I reveal one's information and then the two people act, the highest payoff I can get is one. Why? Because whatever belief I, I induce for good A, the belief on good B will be one minus that belief. So if for one of the players I'm above 0.8 that they buy the good, for the other player I'm below 0.2, so they don't buy the good. So with one right communication, the only thing I can get is, is, is one. I can get one person to buy. And there's, of course, many ways I can use this. I can do full information disclosure. I can do whatever we just, we just did in the previous slide. All of them will give the same payoff. There's, there's indeterminacy a little bit. But in terms of payoffs, the payoff is exactly one. But with sequential, I can do better. Okay, here's how it's going to do better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with good A. I start with this, this prior point, point 0.5, and I'm going to do this, the Bayesian persuasion that we saw on the previous slide. Okay, I will either induce zero, I will induce point 0.8. When I happen to induce point, if I happen to induce zero, then I know this person is not going to buy because they learned this is a low quality good for them, but that implies the other person knows that the good is, is high quality for them and they buy. So if that's that, if I part, I'm a part of that tree, the payoff is one. Now, in case I end up here, where is it? Here? If I end up here at point eight, then I tell the first person, okay, now you've seen the information, you make a decision, they buy, but I have an opportunity now to go to the other person and say, yeah, I know that you think probability that your good is high quality is only 20%. Let me give you a little extra information. And then with probability a quarter, I will be able to reverse the beliefs. So I started at a half. I first showed the per per person B some bad news. Their belief went down to 0.2. But now I'll create information that will now move their belief to either 0 or 0.8. And I can get them to 0.8 with probability a quarter. And then the expected payoff, instead of being one, which is the best payoff I can do with one round communication, will be 1.15, 1.16, which is strictly one. So that's one trick how sequential communication can help is doing these belief reversals. I go first in one direction to one person, I convince them to buy, and then because beliefs are not degenerate yet, I can now go in the opposite direction and still convince the other person, okay? And of course, you can see these two nodes. One is the key of this model of the benefits is the, the, the actions are not reversible. Okay. In some situations, it will be a bad assumption. In some situations, I think it's a good assumption. If you think about the recruiting example, you know, once we contacted the person, we made them an offer, and then we, we next week, we evaluate somebody else, and it's now the company may be thinking, oh, maybe we made a mistake making an offer to that person. Well, too late. Okay. Similarly, 
once the bill gets passed, it's just very hard to then unpass it. Okay? It's not impossible, but it's but it's hard. So <clears throat> you can imagine modeling a little bit differently. You can imagine that maybe actions can be undone at the cost. So then the question will be, you know, how 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 is the cost versus how big of a reversal we do and so on. You know, we haven't done any of this in the paper. Um, the other assumption that is happening here is that the players learn from the signals, but they don't learn from each other's payoffs. So the idea would be that when we convince player A to buy, they bought, and player B sees that the player A bought, but then on, it takes time for player A to realize what the good was higher qual or low quality, similar with the bill. We pass a bill and we want to understand what the long-term long -term consequences of this bill. Well, we'll not learn the long-term consequences until we pass the other bill anyway. So that's kind of how we are thinking about it. And then the key economic force in this model is there is this information leakage. And when I reveal information about one of the goods, it also reveals information about the other good because the because the probability, the, the distribution over the types, over, the, over the, the states is not independent. Okay, so it was one example which was built on this negative correlation and belief reversal. It turns out that's not the only place where this, where this dynamic communication can help. Here's an example of perfect positive correlation. So a perfect positive correlation, again, I have two goods. I have two people. They know that either both of the goods are high quality or both the goods are low quality, but they have different preferences. Person one has threshold 0.6 and person two has threshold 0.8. Okay, so here's now the payoff of the seller. If they induce posterior below 0.5, nobody buys. If they induce posterior between 0.6 and 0.8, one person buys. And if they go above 0.8, uh, both people buy. Okay, this is now a you know two-step, two-step or three-step function. We do the concavification, and the best thing you would do is you would induce posterior, if you start with a prior 0.5, you induce posterior 0 0.0 or 0.8, and you get expected payoff 1.25 uh, with, within, you know, with probability five over eight, you get the belief to 0.8 and then both, both people buy. But turns out I can do better. I can do sequentially better in the following way. In the first step, I'll try to convince just, just the first person, which is easier to convince. I send the first their beliefs to either 0 or 0 0.6. If it's 0, I'm done. There's nothing else I can do. But it's 0.6, I tell this first person to buy, and I get with some probability them buy. And then condition 0.6, then I go to the other person, and now I'll do this little bit extra, of concavifications, it's hard to show in this picture. I would have to have two different pictures. But I'm going now. I'm starting with a belief 0.6, and I'm doing the standard one-shot persuasion with a person with a cutoff point, point 0.8. And now, with some probability, the second piece of information will send me to zero. Okay. When that happens, I will still get one sale versus if I do it simultaneously, I get zero sales. So I get a little bit extra benefit. And this is what you can see that the payoff is high. Okay. So these are two examples that illustrate that sometimes these things happen through reversals. They sometimes they happen through kind of slowly moving in one direction. And, um, you know, the example three is just saying if, if the beliefs were independent, then of course it doesn't matter whether I do it simultaneously or sequentially, because now if I send information to one person, it doesn't move beliefs of the other person. So whether I do it sequentially or simultaneously, I get exactly the same payoff. So here's a summary of the three examples. I had an example with negative correlation, with positive correlation and independent. And I, with simultaneous, I can compute payoffs. With sequential, I can compute payoffs. And you can see these go this way, but here it's equal. Okay. Now the question is, okay, so I got an improvement. How big of an improvement is it? You know, can I, are there other things that it could, would do even better? And, and if there's a question, sure, go ahead. Arda? Yeah, so Andy, it's true 
Of course, as you pointed out, that the irreversibility of the actions plays a crucial role here. But it seems like also the fact that the buyers cannot delay their decisions is also playing a crucial role. Am I right? That's exactly exactly right. You know, they would always want, if we want thought about them delaying, they will always want to go last. Mm -hmm. Because the person going last always has the most information. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe that leads us to some kind of a war of attrition problem. But, you know, we have none of this in, in the model. The way I think about this is that the sender has, has control not only over the information, but also over the order. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the president doesn't have control over which, which bills get passed, which don't. But they have control over how they can, you know, in which order they can introduce things. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about another example, think about Apple facing lawsuits in many different countries with regulators reviewing their policies for, say, their app store. And there's some communication that happens there, which is secret, but, but some of the communication is public because when the regulators in different countries make decisions, they write these public public decision letters. And from those decision letters, it can be inferred, not necessarily the data, what exactly was the data they were looking at, but what data was available. So they, they will not publish exact data, but they will say, well, we reviewed information about A and B and C. And then the next regulator in the next country, when they also want to review Apple, can say, we already know you have this data. So we also want to see it, okay? And now in terms of the order there, you know, Apple, I think, has a level of influence. Their lawyers could be playing different strategies in different countries, trying to make sure some countries go faster, some countries go slower. But to some extent there, I think the order is exogenous and it's, you know, outside the control of the sender. And some of the results here will depend on the order. And the answer will be, you know, if you don't like this assumption that the sender can choose the order, then the answer would be, well, for some orders, if they get lucky, they will be able to benefit and for some orders they won't. So if you, if you look at the, our examples, the first example with the negative correlation, it didn't matter in which order it went. <coughs> so there, as long as they can, they can convince the countries to go not to go at the same time, the, uh, Apple would be happy. Or similarly, if a politician says, you know, there are different constituencies con that, that would like Bill A versus Bill B, I don't want to have them at the same time because they will, you know, if I convince once, I will not be able to convince the others. And, and you have a couple of other questions. Sure, go ahead. Steve. Hey, Andy, good to see you. Um, to see <clears> quick you. question. Uh, so in this example that you just gave uh, with the positive correlation, you first approached the uh, receiver <clears throat> who has more optimistic beliefs, right? There seems to be something intuitive about that order. Yeah. I'm wondering if that still is true if you have different sizes of groups. So for example, if instead of one guy at 0.6 and one person at 0.8, you had three people at 0.6 or maybe even two and one at 0.8. And then if you go for the 0.6 first and it's the bad realization, you lose a lot more people and then you could lose the future. So will that also yeah. play a role? <clears throat> so there will be cases and we'll be able to say what the optimal order is. So in this example, the sizes of the groups don't matter. What will matter is, is who... Who is the easiest to convince to take the action you want? Okay, not so much the payoff. And, uh, and there will be other cases in which finding the optimal sequence is very hard. It will be, and then, then those relative payoffs will matter a lot. So some cases we know what the order is. In this example, I know what the order is, but in other cases it will be harder. Alex? Thank you. Uh, hey, uh, I have a question about this application that, that you mentioned about the apple and the politician. Uh -huh. uh, so how to think about these applications from the perspective whether the sender is informed or uninformed? Because I would imagine that Apple precisely knows which data it has and, and reveals facts which are favorable to its position and similarly for politicians. Whereas in this model, 
because the standard. Yeah, so I'm, I'm with you to some extent. That's that's a problem with the with the Bayesian persuasion model, right? That, that the way you would want to attack it is 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 to kind of go a little bit beyond the Bayesian persuasion. So I think some of the examples I think with Apple is that there is a question whether they will even give, give access to the data and they may not even be sure whether after they give access to the data, whether the data will paint a positive or negative picture. It's they, because they may not fully know what the experts on both sides, how they will, you know, what inferences they, they will they will make from this data. But clearly there are some pieces of information that they know this is, you know, if we could hide this memo, that would be good for us, right? Right. I think with a politician, the example would be, I think it's discussing certain elements and not being certain in which direction the public opinion will take those elements. You know, in a bill, there would be hundreds of things and they kind of strategically have to think which of them to highlight. And they may have some priors over, you know, whether highlighting these things will move the public opinion in one direction or the other. But I think that's a little, you know, they, they do face some uncertainty in which direction it will go. So that's kind right. of what, you know, when Biden became the president, there was this all this question, how big is the, the, you know, the wave to the left? You know, how far can the Democrats push the bills? And I think the idea exactly as Steve was suggesting is, well, it sounds like they were trying to go with the bills which were less, con less controversial and over time to move towards to more controversial, exactly as, as this example would suggest. But uh, yeah. Great. Yes, I and guess one could also interpret it as a, as, a, as a kind of upper benchmark of what you can achieve. And maybe there are some cases where even with voluntary disclosure model, you can achieve the same outcome. Uh, I'm not sure what they thought about it, but uh, yeah, I, maybe not. I think it would be quite interesting to start combining this general thinking that there are benefits of doing it it's sequentially with models right. that go beyond Bayesian persuasion, with models that, that the sender is actually privately informed and doesn't have full commitment. You know, they yeah. are, of course, there's, I always preferred for Bayesian persuasion to take this model that the sender is uninformed. They decide what kind of data to generate and then they learn together with the market. There's this other, you know, this other modeling in which the Bayesian persuasion that they're informed, but they kind of, before they became informed, they committed to certain information policies. Okay. Yeah. Sure. If you believe in that comment, commitment, that's fine. I, I always prefer the first, first interpretation. That's why my examples tend to go that direction. Mm -hmm. And hell? Yes, thank you. So uh, it's just a clarifying question. So why do you call the three cases negative correlation, positive correlation, independent correlation? There's no randomness in the thresholds of the of the yeah, yeah. So, so this is not about preferences, but it's about the states. So in the first example, either good A was good or good B. So oh, if, I see. when beliefs went up before one of the agents, they were going down for the other. The I second see. example, they were either both good or both bad. So when you move beliefs for one agent, the other agent's beliefs were moving the same direction. And then the third example was they were independent. You could move beliefs for one agent without moving beliefs for the other agent. Thank you. Good. And you are right that in a sense, you know, with two agents, I can always rename the state, the state and be about, you know, I can turn the negative correlation to a positive correlation, just they have the opposite preferences. Okay. It's a little bit more complicated when you have more than two agents, because then you cannot always turn the definition such that everybody has positive correlation. There are examples that that's not possible. Good. Okay. So the next step I'm going to do is I'm going to say, how good is this good are these, these improvements? And it's going to go through this definition of what's the first best. The upper bound of what you can achieve is the following. Take the joint probability distribution over the states, calculate the marginals, calculate everybody's, every individual receiver's beliefs, and replace the joint probability distribution with an independent distribution with the same margins. Now we have no information leakage. Now I can do 
dimension by dimension Bayesian persuasion. And what a payoff I get from that is an upper bound of what I can get in any of those procedures if types are correlated either positively or negatively. Okay. So here's what we've done. We've calculated the first best for these three cases and not surprisingly when they're independent, they are the same. But the interesting pattern is that in one of the examples, we actually got already the first best, but in the other example, we didn't, okay? So now the question will be the following, you know, under what conditions can we get that the sequential procedure will strictly improve upon the simultaneous one? Can we find even more complicated procedures than what I've shown you so far that would do even better? And then also, you know, what's an optimal sequence, what, what Steve was asking. And in some cases, it will be easy. In some cases, it will be hard. And so that's why I call it hard. <laughs> okay. So this is... So Andy, the Go ahead. Andy, can I clarify? The only sure. reason here we can't get, we can't always get first pass is because of the public information disclosure restriction. True. Very well. So... A different way of defining the first best turns out to be that in our model, if I could send private signals, then you know what the information I send to one person doesn't change beliefs to the, of the other person. And given that there is no externalities, as Pei you pointed out, that there's that the agents don't play in a game and the playoffs of the send of the sender are additive, I can just do through private signals persuasion person by person, and then I will get the first best. So there are, there are two ways to think about the first best. One is I replace the beliefs. The other one is I send private communication. So you can interpret our results saying, the sender would like to send private messages, but suppose they cannot do that. What's the cost of publicity? And could they undo the cost of publicity by doing it sequentially? And the answer is sometimes they can undo it fully and sometimes they cannot. And we'll ask, you know, could they design something even more clever to fully undo the cost of publicity? Right. So because when you do sequential disclosure, it seems like <laughs> you're essentially doing some sort of private persuasion. Exactly. One, I'm doing right? it private to the first person. Exactly. But when I, but the kind of the, the pri privacy drops as I keep on going in the sequence. Right, but it has to be more and more informative. It cannot be like Bergman Morris, whatever private information you do, right? That's exactly, right. exactly. So yep. once you reveal something, you cannot hide it. And the idea yep. being, well, if Apple gives access to certain data that reveals that the, you know, that one of the regulators learns through disclosure that Apple was was collecting data on something, or that has has ability to to run an experiment of certain kind and they write it in the report, that cat is out of the bag and the other regulator can ask Apple, we, we also want you to run, run the same experiment in our country. Okay, good. Yep. Uh, so here's the model. The model will now will generalize it between two, two receivers. So there'll be N plus one players, a sender and N receivers. There'll be N binary states. Each each agent, each receiver will care only about their own dimension of the of the states. There will be a common prior, but that doesn't, you know, the, the interesting thing is it's not going to be symmetric. It's not going to be, but more importantly, it's not going to be independent. The receivers will take some arbitrary actions. So we're, we're going beyond binary action. So the action is going to be a function of the agent's posterior belief. Xi will be the notation sorry, the notation for the, for the beliefs. The sender's payoff will be additive. Uh, what I'm going to show you, they will care only about the actions. You can generalize it that, they, that the sender also cares about the state or at least cares about the beliefs. It, it requires a little bit extra notation. That's why we decided not to do it. And then we'll I'll abuse notation that once I know what actions people take given the beliefs, I'll be writing that the payoffs of the sender actually depend only on the beliefs. Okay, that's the standard stuff. And then a simultaneous procedure will be you design one random variable signal S, which is somehow correlated with, with the, with the multidimensional state omega. And then after we reveal this information, capital S, you see everybody sees realization, little s, 
people form posterior beliefs about their dimension and take their actions. So the payoff of the sender is going to be the expected sum uh, that comes from the posteriors induced by the one signal. And then for the sequential procedures, we'll look at two procedures. The first one will be like in the examples, we call it a, a, a sequential procedure. The sender will commit to an order in which they approach the receivers. And then to each receiver, they will send a signal. The signal is accumulative in the sense that whatever you yield to one sender becomes available to all senders. And then the senders, you know, the, the sender, sorry, the sender will send signal one, the receiver one takes action, signal two, the receiver two sees both signals, now they take their action, and so on. And then so can I, I can I clarify? Signal, go ahead, go ahead. Andy, can I clarify? So sure. when you send SI, it's only about omega I or it's about auto omega, the entire vector. So you can do it about everything. You're, you're not constrained at all. It will turn okay. out to be optimal to send information about only that person. But even though you're sending information only about omega I, all the beliefs will be moving because the states are correlated. Right. So in principle, you could send this information about every, about all the you know all the dimensions, but it will not be optimal to do so, because because the problem that the sender faces is this information leakage. They don't want the beliefs of other people to be moving. Like when I'm trying to to persuade you, I don't want uh, uh, Alex's or or Max's beliefs to be moving because if I move their beliefs, it constrains me at the time when I'm trying to, to persuade them because, because instead of being at the prior, they're already at some posterior. Okay. And then the flexible fractional procedure would allow me to gradually send information and adjusting the sequence based on the, on the information that I see. Okay. And in some situations, say it's Biden pr proposing bills, I think the sequential procedure is a better example. I think in some situations, you could imagine that the sender has a lot of power in terms of choosing the order, that they, they don't even have to commit uh, to the order at the beginning, okay? So some quick preliminary results. You know, clearly I can do weakly better with sequential procedure than the simultaneous procedure because I can always just reveal in the first stage all the information that I would do in simultaneous and then stay quiet afterwards. And then it just replicates the simultaneous one. And then <coughs> this object, which is, I calculate the concavification dimension by dimension and they take this and then I take the sum. That's the upper bound on what I can receive because that's what I would do with if, if, if the beliefs were independent, okay? So that's the upper bound. And then let me get to the theorem one. So the theorem one says the following, the sequential procedure, the simple sequential procedure strictly improves upon the simultaneous, simultaneous procedure if and only if the simultaneous procedure doesn't achieve the first best itself. So there will be examples in which the simultaneous one already gets the first best, but if it doesn't get the first best, if the information leakage is a problem, then there always exists a simple sequential procedure that strictly improves upon that. So let me show you the proof. I'm going to do it on, only, you know, only one direction because the other direction is obvious. So suppose the simultaneous procedure does not achieve the first best. That means there exists at least one dimension, at least one receiver for whom the simultaneous one payoff is less than the concavification for that dimension. Okay, let's, without loss of generality, call it player one. And there will be three cases now, how it can happen. The first case is that we already at the prior, at the cov, but the simultaneous procedure, because it moves beliefs of other players, reveals some information that this agent will use to update and will bring him the payoff of the sender below this cov. So here's the example. The payoff of player of the receiver one is already concave. And the payoff of the, of the sender that corresponds to the decision of, of, of player one is already concave. So we would like to reveal no information 
But because the simultaneous procedure reveals information to other players whose payoffs are not concave, we end up in these two posteriors, which is worse. So how can I improve strictly on power of Mondays with a sequential procedure? The sequential procedure will tell this player, you go first with no information. Okay, and after they take this action, I reveal whatever the simultaneous one was doing for everybody else, and I get a strict improvement. Okay, so now the other case is that the concavification is strictly more than no information, so that if I only had to deal with this agent, I would want to reveal some information. Okay, and then what do we know? Then the picture is going to look like this. This is the prior. And the concavification, because we're only in two dimensions, there's only two states, higher and low, we are doing concavification just in R1. So I know there exists these two critical beliefs, one to the right, one to the left of the prior, that the, that the optimal concavification would bring me either to the left or to the right. Okay. Now there could be some special cases in which things are flat or linear, that there's more than you know, there is, there is some indeterminacy of those points. Let's not worry about it. You know, we, we dealt with this in the paper. So there are these two points. Now, if I'm not achieving the first best, there are two possibilities. One possibility is that there exists a posterior given the simultaneous signal that brings me to a posterior belief strictly in between those two cutoffs. Okay, so that would be a picture in which when I do it sequential, Sorry, when I do simultaneous, with positive probability, this belief gets induced. Then I can do a strict improvement in the following way. I let everybody else, all the N minus one receivers go first. Okay, I induce this, all these beliefs. I go, everybody else go first. And then I come to this receiver and I say, oh, you happen to have this belief. Let me give you a little bit extra information. Now let me do concavification and I'll send you here or here. And that's going to give a strict improvement because instead of getting this payoff, I'm going to get that payoff. Okay, so that's case two. If one of the posteriors is in between the, the critical threshold. So the only case we are left with is that the simultaneous procedure induces posteriors, all of them are either at the critical beliefs or outside, none of them is in between. And yet I'm not getting the concavification pair. Then the trick is the following. Now I will make this person go first. And before I send the signal S that I was going to send to everybody, I'm going to do this signal jamming, it's not signal jamming, how do we call it, garbling. There are some beliefs to the left of this point. There are some beliefs to the right of this of the critical point. I'm going to now combine them together with a completely uninformative signal so that when a person, re instead of receiving signals that bring them to these posteriors, when I create this new binary signal structure, which is a garbling, they will end up either in this point or in that point. Okay. So you can think about it as I, I just do this construction. I have the simultaneous signal, and then I, I group all the beliefs, all the signals that bring me here and to one set and all the ones that bring me here to this set. And then I mix them in with a completely informative signal so that now this, this object is going to move me towards the prior, which is X1. And I can always do it so that I always hit these points. Now for this player, I achieve exactly the curve and then once I achieve the curve for that player, I reveal the, you know, what, how these signals were created, like what were the underlying things that I have grouped together so that everybody else, when they move, they get the original information I was planning to give them. And again, I get strict improvement. Okay, so that's the first theorem that I can always improve with the simple st st structure. And now I'm going to show you a second theorem, which says, if I could be adjusting the order in which people move, based on the information I observe, I could do even better. Okay, so let's go to our example one in which the example one was the perfect negative correlation. And in that example, 
we have a way to prove that the best sequential procedure is actually the one that I showed you, that you first move to point A or zero for one agent. If you get at zero, you're stuck. You, only the second agent will buy. If you're at point eight, you sell to the first agent and then you, you do the reversal that you go with probably a quarter, you move, move to point two. In this example, we, we have a proof that this is the best sequential thing, but the first best is strictly better. And here is the way how you can do even better. The trick is the following. You start with a belief, 0.5, and the two curves, the black curve is for, for agent A, and the, the red curve is for agent B. Okay, so now, as Angel, we discussed, you know, I redefined the state, so now I have positive, perfect positive correlation, but the preferences are flipped. And now the trick I will do is I will first induce beliefs that bring me either to point eight or point two. And after I see which one of the two I hit, I'm going to decide which player moves first. If it's point eight, it's player A. If it's point two, it's player B. Okay. So I know for sure one of them will buy. And then I'm still in the interior of the concavity I said. So now I can. I can do Bayesian persuasion, optimal Bayesian persuasion on the other player. And the fact that I revealed any information doesn't cost me anything because I have not crossed over these critical thresholds. Okay? So in this example, I can get first best. And here's the theorem. The theorem says the optimal flexible sequential procedure always achieves the first best. Now let me show you the proof we call it the Pac-Man procedure. So <clears throat> I'll show you the example with two receivers, receiver one and two. I believe here, one, you know, they start with these priors, X1 and X2. And, and what's important, there is a, they have these two critical thresholds, both of them being to the right and to the left of the prior. And the way I can do it is the following. I will start gradually revealing information about state one. By gradually, I mean through some continuous time process so the beliefs move continuously, some kind of Brownian motion. So this, this little Pac-Man is going to be moving right and left. Okay, it's moving right and left. Now, because the states are correlated, as I move this Pac-Man, this Pac-Man will also be moving around. Okay. At some point, one of those two Pac-Mans is going to hit one of the four th critical thresholds. I don't know which one, because it kind of depends on the correlation structure and depends on how far the thresholds are from the prior. But sooner or later, you know, this is beliefs are a martingale, and I'm only stopping when I'm hitting one of those, and they have to converge at some point. So they can only stop when they are the, the boundary, so they will stop. And as soon as I hit one of those boundaries, I say, stop, this person takes a decision. This person takes a decision, I remove them from the set, and then I continue until I run out of people. Importantly, every person will they take a decision, they will take it at one of the critical thresholds. And hence, then I achieve what private persuasion would, would achieve, that every person takes a decision only at one of the two thresholds. And because beliefs are martingales, it was exactly replicate uh, the static private persuasion. If you don't like this continuous time processes, here's a different procedure. What I do is for each Pac-Man, I calculate the distance going to the right and to the left. These are these deltas. There is how, the, how big distance is here versus how big is distance here. I rank people based on these distances. And then I create a binary signal that goes to the right or to the left for that person that has the smallest distance. Okay. And then probability, there is a lemma that says, when I move beliefs of one of the player, the beliefs of the other players move by less than one to one. So I move somebody believe by 0.2, all the other players at most beliefs move by 0.2 because correlation is imperfect. Okay. And that what it allow, tells me is that when I do these steps, we're probably at a half in every round 
one of the people still remaining will be quitting. Okay, so there will be a countable number of these rounds that is necessary. And I have this conjecture that actually one could generalize this Pac-Man 2 procedure to allow, instead of binary signals, to allow more than com more complex signals, and that will require you only n rounds of communication to get rid of everybody. Okay, I'm 99%. It's sure. It seems very tedious to write the proof, so I I did it, and I couldn't convince Elon to spend two days of his life to do it either. So yeah, so that's where we are. Okay. Now, what's the optimal sequence? It's very easy to say what's the optimal sequence when I have perfect correlation. <coughs> so let me define this delta. This is the distance for player I, how far I have to go in beliefs to the left to hit the critical threshold. And then for player I, how much I have to go to the right uh, to get reach the critical threshold. And now here is a proposition. Suppo so I let me count rank people in their distances to the left and, and rank people in terms of distances to the right. Okay. If the orderings agree that the people who have to be the least persuaded to the right are also the people who need to be the least persuaded to the left, then the simple sequential procedure achieves already the first best. This was the example two that we had. There was this ranking that one person was a threshold point zero on one side and 0.6 on the other, and the other person had zero and 0.8, so the rankings agreed. There's always a question of how to deal with ties, and the answer is, I will say that the rankings agree if there exists a way of breaking the ties in a way that the rankings agree. And then if the rankings agree, then you can achieve the first best with the sequential procedure. And, and that's going to, to be the right, the right order. You start with the people you need to persuade the least. Now, if correlations are not perfect, then the, then the orderings don't have to be exactly the same to be able to achieve the first best. But roughly going in this, this order of going with the people who you need to convince the least is going to be the right rule. Okay. Now, going back to the discussion we had with Steve, in case the orderings don't agree, now the ordering will be hard and, and exactly what the payoffs are will start mattering. You say, you know, I, I may, may prefer to go with a person who, you know, the thresholds on to the right more extreme than, than the other person, but their payoff is more important. So I'm going to sacrifice some, some information. Okay, to finish, we've done in, with some extensions. Notice in the model, we have very general payoff structures in terms of, you know, the Fs can be arbitrary and the action space may be arbitrary, but we have binary states. And you may ask, you know, what about if the states are not binary, if they're arbitrary? And the answer is, first of all, we can no longer guarantee that the sequential you know, even the flexible procedure will achieve the first best. And moreover, uh, even when first best is not achieved, sometimes we cannot get an improvement. So let me explain a little bit. Remember the theorem one, I had these three cases. When I go beyond binary states, if I'm not getting the first best with simultaneous because of case one or case two, then still the proof goes through with, with arbitrary state space. But the case three is the one pr which is problematic. Case three was the case where the simultaneous one reveals a lot of information that pushes me beyond the critical, critical thresholds. And the trick there was I would do this garbling to push beliefs towards the prior to hit the critical thresholds. And in what, if I'm in R1, then I'm always guaranteed that if I started outside the convex hull of the critical thresholds, if I move towards the prior, I will hit them. But once you go to R2, R3, R5, you're no longer guaranteed that if you start with beliefs, okay, when you start with beliefs which are outside the convex hull of the critical thresholds, yes, you can always do, do garbling that will bring you towards the convex hull of the critical thresholds. 
But the trick is that you don't care about hitting the convex hull of the critical threshold. You have to actually hit the critical threshold. And once you move towards the prior, you may miss the, you know, you, you may miss because the lines which bring you towards the prior may not be crossing through any of the critical thresholds. So when we, it's possible to create these examples that show you that in those cases, you cannot get improvement. So that's one thing that we know. And then the other thing that we know is that we started playing with what happens beyond additive payoff. So one direction is to think that the receivers are playing a game that we haven't touched at all. We are more interested in a case in which the sender doesn't care additively about the decisions. And the example we have in mind is voting. So think about, you know, in the US at some point when T-Mobile and Sprint were trying to merge, they had to convince multiple regulators to approve the merger. And it was not, the payoffs were not additive. Either all of them would approve it or not or if even one of them would veto, the merger doesn't go through. And similarly, if you're trying to convince uh, a hiring committee, you may need to get big enough majority of people saying yes. So, so now the payers are not that big. So we haven't, this is kind of a topic we'll be working over hopefully the next year, but we, we know we have some examples by now. So let's take the example one with the negative correlation. What you get is that with negative correlation, <coughs> if suppose suppose that these are two, you know, we go to the example one, you need both of them to say yes to get a payoff of one. And if at least one of them vetoes, you get a payoff of zero. But then if you have to do it simultaneously, your payoff is zero. There's nothing you can do. There's no way of inducing a belief, one belief that both of them will say yes. But doing it sequentially, because as you saw in our procedure, achieved that with positive probability, both of them bought, you can get a success with positive probability. So kind of this divide and conquer via sequential procedure could work. Now here, the first best will have to be defined differently. The first best cannot be defined what happens if, if beliefs are independent. The right first best will be, what's the best you can achieve with private communication. And even in this example, we, we started playing with, with examples and even computing the first best is tricky because, because of the correlation. There's some, there's some recent work that, this, that characterizes the set of posterior beliefs you can induce. And the key is that the beliefs will now be correlated. And when the payoffs, when the payoffs were of the sender were additive, I didn't care about the correlation. But now when they are not in the additive, now the sender will care about the fact that the posteriors will be correlated. So even that seems like a hard problem, but we think it will be fun. And you know, our conjecture is that at least with unanimity, unanimity voting, uh, we think that, that if the simultaneous one doesn't achieve the first best, the sequential one will be able to, to, to improve, but we'll see whether that happens, okay? Good, so in summary, what this is what we have done. We have two, these two theorems. One says, even if you cannot be fully flexible, even if you have to predetermine the order, sequential one will improve on the simultaneous one, if and only if the simultaneous one already doesn't achieve the first best. And then theorem two is if you can be even more, more sneaky in choosing the order as the information comes out, you can actually completely undo the cost of, of public communication and the optimal order will tend to have this feature that you want to start with persuading on the dimensions where the distance between the prior and the critical thresholds is the small. That's all for me today. Thank you very much. Um, right on time and a great presentation, very clear. So uh, let's move to the questions. And as our tradition, shall we start with our panelists? Um, uh, maybe Faye, is there any, any final comment sure. or question that you can? Sure, I just want to clarify, because when I see a summary, it gave me the feeling that, um, again, comparing 
Bergman Morris and the sequential sequential procedure. It seems like because in uh, sequential procedure, you can provide different information to different receiver, but it has to be ordered in terms of like, well, it's more and more informative. If we go beyond binary states, is it true that if we can order decision maker in terms of someone is more difficult to be convinced? I don't know how to formalize. Maybe it is something like, suppose we do private persuasion, each agents, we can, we can order each agent's private belief in terms of mean preserving uh, spread. Very is that well. sufficient and necessary to replicate first best using sequential or it's just it's just necessary and not sufficient? You know, so that's a great I never thought about it that way. That's a very way, very, very clever way of thinking about it. So here is the answer. Suppose we are, you know, the states are k-dimensional. Yep. And suppose let's, let's just keep it simple that the the prior is the same. We start with the same prior, and the and the states are either positive or negatively correlated, but that doesn't matter. But suppose the critical threshold. So I, I define a critical threshold saying for each person, if so I was doing only Bayesian persuasion of this person, you know, what are the extreme points of the concavification thing? So suppose that the extreme points of, of the different receives are ordered in the following sense. If I look at the convex hull of the critical thresholds, there I have a set inclusion. That your critical thresholds are in the convex hull of Alex's, Alex's critical thresholds and his critical threshold in the convex hull of Elon's. Then even the simple procedure that I will start with you, then go to Alex, go to Elon, will get me first best. And the intuition is that if I persuade you towards your point, all the posterior beliefs for you will still be in the convex hall of Alex. And because beliefs are imperfectly correlated, for Alex, they will be even closer. You know, there will be now, I start with your beliefs and then I will do some contraction towards the prior because of the imperfect correlation. So in no sta stage, I will, the problem with providing information is I will sometimes overshoot the, the critical beliefs. Yeah. But if they stand within the convex call, I will never do it. So providing a little bit of this information doesn't create any costs. And that's why I'll get the first best. So that would be, that's a nice generalization to more, to more states. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alex. So, any, any sorry, can, can I just follow up on that? Okay, so, because maybe I just didn't quite get because this was one of my questions: which kind of positive results you could have for general state space? And and say, uh, and I was thinking more about say there is a common state, so it's perfectly correlated state, but it's multi-dimensional. So, so what? So would your uh, argument apply to somehow? Because I think in so what, what could be sufficient condition, for example, in which sequential procedure could get first best in that case? So this, so the, if the thresholds are, if the critical thresholds are kind of like the Russian dolls, that they're ranked in set inclusion, that, that's sufficient condition. Beyond that, Great. it's very hard for me to think about it because- But for example, if, would one think- Go ahead. If a convex hole of this stretch, if the convex holes are nested, would that be sufficient condition? Yeah, so, so that's what I said. I think that's what I was yeah. trying to say. If the convex yeah. holes of the, of right. the critical threshold are nested, then, then the answer is that's sufficient. Yes. That's sufficient. But, if, but you could imagine- But we don't know whether it's necessary, right? We don't know whether it's necessary. Right. In general, it will not be necessary. Yeah. yeah. But- you know, maybe if it's perfect correlation, maybe it is necessary. But if it's imperfect correlation, clearly it's not necessary because, you know, I can, all, I can always bring correlation very close to zero and then, then everything will go, go through. Great. So, but the issue is, the issue is if they are not nested, think about the, 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 right. the beliefs are in R2, you know, Yours may be on the horizontal line and mine may be on exactly. the vertical line. But my critical threshold, you know, like it's a, it's a, it's, it's a cross. Yeah. 
And once I go on the horizontal, then on the vertical, I cannot go go back. You know, I cannot shrink it back. So, so that's that's kind right. of the classical example. Yeah, and this used to be generic for with binary actions, right? So, if you have binary actions of each receiver, then you binary have actions this. don't do anything. You know, it's it's more of a question: what's the mapping from beliefs to actions? The fact that they are, you know, if you allow me to have. But binary actions imply that you it's sufficient to split beliefs in two, so it will be each on the line. It's harder to align this to this interval. Yeah, but, no? but if, if the, that's true. If binary actions, it's enough to induce two posteriors. You're right, but then it could still be which of the two posteriors in the two dimensional space for one agent versus the other one that they are not right. line, sitting on the same line. Exactly. So it's it seems unlikely that they would lie on the same line. It's less exactly. generic if you have if you have course exactly. actions. It's harder to do that. Seems to be exactly. So the only so this is why I would be thinking that with if you the only case it would would work is that. So now what's interesting is so that tells me okay so that the fact that they are in convex hull of each other that's not it's not necessary. So even in this example, so let's uh, let me see if I can do a quick graph. Uh, so, uh, let's share screen again. Share. Okay. Let's create here. Or right there, let me just find an empty slide. Uh, Okay, let's do it. Let's do it here. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so suppose we're in two dimensions. Well, suppose that's the prior. Mm -hmm. And suppose one of the players has these critical beliefs and the other player has these critical beliefs. The fact that I revealed this, you know, so then for player one, this is player one, and this is player two, and this is the prior. You see that because these two posteriors are still sitting in this rectangle. Uh, no, but from no, this belief, no, I cannot no. induce these two posteriors. Yeah, exactly, because you need convex yeah. hull of this, and they will not. They have to be in the convex hull. Yeah. So that will be suggesting that that with binary actions, once we go to binary, you know, this, this is very interesting because it suggests that whether generically this can happen or not is kind of a race between the dimensionality of the states versus dimensionality of actions. Yeah. That's, I did not see this coming. <laughs> Thank you. It's now, is it going back, Alex, but going back to this. So it's true that without lots of generality, thank you, Steve. <laughs> without the lots of generality of our binary, binary actions, it's enough to induce only two beliefs. But it still doesn't mean, you know, in some cases, maybe. Right, there could be multiplicity. There could, there be, could multiplicity. be still multiplicity. So that's, that still doesn't resolve that issue, right? Because I mean, the question whether it's generic. generic. Yeah. Right. Yes. No, but it's interesting to think about. So that would be like an interesting question. Now, the other issue would be, you know, that tells you cannot get first best. But you could still get improvements over simultaneous. Yeah, for sure. Which I think that's more. When when we present this work, people have very different opinions about the the relative. In, you know, which which of the two theorems is more interesting? Some people think that the Bachmann theorem is more interesting because it gets you exactly first best. It's kind of cleaner. It's more beautiful. And we actually think that the first theorem is more interesting because. Because it's it's a little bit easier to see that you can get improvements when you can get first best. The fact that you can always get improvements, even though you're not guaranteed the first best, that required much more work. So that's why we are more proud of the of the first theorem, and we think 
Yeah, in a sense, I think both they talk about different situations, right? So I think there are situations in which people can control dynamically in which order things do, but but there are many decisions in which the order gets pre-announced very clearly. Great. But even for first uh, theorem, right, for multiple uh, states, you say there is some, um, I mean, uh, so could you strengthen somehow the par part because you said there is a case three in which you cannot extend it Yeah. generally, right? So did you think about conditions for which you could do that? That would be, I guess, interesting. <laughs> the only conditions we thought about ex are exactly along this line mm -hmm. of, 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 of thinking, you know, are these convex holes right? And you know it's easy to do with two players when there's like many players. Yes, not for it's, sure. It's a little bit more unclear. Uh, I I think if this would depend on the particular applications you want want to use it for. I think in some applications, if you think about if it's about voting and and you think that that some regulators are kind of more predisposed to mergers than others, then you get you kind of would expect that it would be a natural ranking. And maybe this assumption that these convex holes are unnested is not is not bad. But without applications, I think it's very hard to tell would this nesting be a natural thing or not. Can I ask if anyone else has any other questions before we go offline with the with the broadcasting? Any other questions? Okay, in that case, let me officially at least uh, thank you, Andy, for the great presentation, Alex and Faye for for paneling, interesting questions, Ilan for coming, and everyone else for for joining.